Welcome to the Dunham & Company Giving USA 2022 live webinar. I'm your host, Rick Dunham, founder and chair of Dunham & Company. I have the privilege of serving as a member of the board of the Giving Institute, as well as the immediate past chair of the Giving USA Foundation. Today, it's my honor to introduce our special guest, Una Osley, who's a very good friend and colleague. Una is the Associate Dean for Research and International Programs, as well as Professor of Economics and Philanthropic Studies at the Indiana University Lilly Family School of Philanthropy. Una, for years now, has uh, served as a lead researcher on Giving USA, and like I mentioned, she's a, a great friend and a valued colleague. During this webinar, Una will guide you through the Giving USA 2020, 2022 report and data and help you understand the implications for your organization. During the question and answer, she and I will help you understand how you can create actionable strategies to adapt to the changing philo philanthropic landscape for maximum impact. Uh, Una, let me hand it over to you, and um, I look forward to the time we have with you. Well, thank you so much, Rick. I am truly honored and delighted to join you all virtually, and just so pleased to partner with Dunham and Company on this one of a kind webinar. I just wanna start by saying that Rick has been a wonderful colleague for many, many decades and friend now, as well as a partner and collaborator on this very important report. Just yesterday, we launched Giving USA 2022. So you are among the first in the world to hear these data uh, live from the Lilly Family School. So once again, welcome, and thank you for joining us for this uh, 2022 launch of Giving USA, brought to you by Dun Dunham and Company. So every year uh, we pour through the data and we actually go through all of the findings, thousands of data points. And from those thousands, literally, of data points, I'm going to bring to you the top 10 findings for 2022. So let me start by sharing my screen and sharing this presentation with you, which is Giving USA 2022. I'd like to start by saying that uh, Giving USA is the longest running report on charitable giving. It provides estimates on where all the giving is coming from and also where it's going, where the recipients and destination of those charitable dollars are. Giving USA is also a longitudinal project. We're able to go back all the way to the 1950s to see how giving has changed over time and also what this means for the future of philanthropy. Uh, today, I'd also like to share with you that although times are changing and indeed we have lived through an unprecedented amount of change in the last few years. We still have data to guide us in these very turbulent times and today's presentation will focus on what the key forces are shaping philanthropy, what this means for donor behavior going forward and how this will change our future. So I'll share the two big picture slides and then go right into the top 10 findings. I also encourage you throughout this presentation to send in your questions, comments, what's surprising to you, what's uh, interesting, what have you expected to see perhaps that you did not, and just share that the big news is really great news for American philanthropy. Despite the global pandemic, the economic challenges that many Americans have faced, we've also seen Americans rise to meet this moment with a record level of generosity, $484.85 billion was given. And uh, what we also know, which is very consistent with what we've seen in the past, individuals, American households of all different backgrounds, uh, types, race, ethnicity, religious affiliation, gave very generously to make uh, this new record level of giving possible. The second largest slice of the pie came from foundations at 20% of all giving. But what I want to emphasize is the power of individuals, the power of relationships and engaging donors, because if we were to add the individual slice, half of the foundation segment, which is uh, made up of smaller family foundations, and the bequest, we would have that 88 or 89% of all giving comes from both living and individuals who are deceased. So despite the large share that comes from foundations, 
I want to emphasize the power of relationships and engaging donors. Another point to make is that although we look at these pie charts every year, we've also seen a lot of change taking place just in the last two years. I'll mention a few of those top points. The foundation segment reached this new record of almost 20%. We've also seen foundations move to more unrestricted models of giving and multi-year partnerships and grants that were given. Many foundations increase their overall payout rates in response to the challenges of the 2020 era. Corporations are also a, a big uh, place to watch because corporations have increasingly expanded the ways they engage with nonprofits through cause marketing, uh, sponsorships, and also impact investing. In terms of where all the giving is going, Here's also where we see tremendous shifts taking place in the philanthropic sector. Religion, religious congregations still account for the largest slice of the pie at 27%. But if we were to look at this data in the 1960s and 70s, two thirds of all giving went to religious congregations. So religious congregations are receiving a smaller share of American philanthropy, but that's not to say that uh, religion has diminished its influence because we still know that many charitable organizations have a foundation in religious uh, congregations. For example, uh, the Salvation Army is classified as human services, but we know that it has strong religious roots. Harvard University, my, where I went to college, is considered an educational institution, but if you look back at its history, it was founded as a training ground for clergy. And so uh, we cannot uh, overstate that the big footprint that uh, religious organizations have even now in American philanthropy. Two areas that have been fast growing segments of the philanthropic sector, the environment and international uh, affairs, both account for, you could say, smaller shares of American philanthropy, but they have been fast growing segments and were not tracked uh, until 1987. We've also seen very large gifts going to human services in the wake of the pandemic and uh, increasingly uh, a lot of emphasis on public society benefit, which includes the National Donor Advice Funds and also United Ways, United Jewish Appeals, and many civil rights organizations that have seen large contributions in the wake of uh, George Floyd's murder and many of the events of 2020 and 2021. Now I'm going to share with you the top 10 findings. Every year, our team, as I mentioned, has to make some difficult decisions, but also some exciting decisions about what are really the top 10 findings. And here I'd like to share what those top 10 findings are. So the first one is we want to emphasize that giving remains strong in 2021, despite all the challenges that many nonprofits faced. We should also note that 2020 was also a very successful year. And as many of you pay attention to the news and hear about the possibility of a recession maybe uh, in the horizon, I want to emphasize that We've also seen giving grow during recessions. And so in being an economist, I will emphasize that you've seen one recession, you've seen one recession. Americans have given in both difficult times and also in very prosperous times. So uh, this is a time to actually, uh, I'd say, celebrate the generosity of Americans and emphasize that we did not see donor fatigue set in. Despite the challenges of the period, Americans were able to really uh, match the record that was set in 2020. So uh, there, this is not the time to retreat, but also to recognize that there are still many opportunities that lie ahead. As we look at the record set uh, in terms of 2020 and 2021, it's worth looking back at how giving has in fact changed. I want to just share the data from the 1980s because we have seen a lot of look back because of the higher inflation rates in recent times and also high oil prices. And the last time we had this combination was in the 1970s with the oil shocks of the 70s and the early 80s. 
What we know is that in the 1980s, individuals accounted for a larger share of overall philanthropy and foundations were a much smaller segment. As we look ahead, we've seen that individuals have declined. However, the foundation segment has expanded and charitable bequests have also grown. As you look at this data, keep in mind that uh, at the heart of all this data is still the role of individuals. Many individuals wear many hats. They may sit on a foundation board. They may actually uh, be part of a corporation. Many corporations have matching dollars. And actually, a lot of the data show that only 25% of corporate matching dollars are secured. So this is a great opportunity to think about all the different hats that donors wear and how you as an organization can build relationships with individuals as they sit in different roles and wear many hats. The second finding as our team reflected on this data is the need to pay attention to the economic, the social, and even the political environment. Uh, in 2020 and 2021, we noted how all of the economic and social factors combined to create a very uh, strong giving env environment. Let me start with the obvious, the economy. In 2021, we had very strong growth in both financial markets and economic indicators. Both of those led to record levels of giving. In addition, we had opportunities to give. Many nonprofits were able to connect with donors on economic events, uh, the level of uh, insecurity that many Americans were facing, the COVID pandemic, the movement for racial justice. However, we should also note that some challenges lie ahead for nonprofits as they continue to navigate this very uh, turbulent economic environment. In particular, uh, our economies are now facing one of the highest inflation rates on record. And we have to look back almost 40 years to see something even comparable. In addition to the inflationary pressures in the economy, we also have uh, strong forces uh, in terms of labor market shortages and supply chain disruption. So nonprofits are having to navigate some new factors in 2021 that weren't present in 2020 and in 2022 as well, I should note. Uh, just a quick summary, uh, many have asked, what should we watch going forward? And as we comb through all the data, I'd say if you have to pick one factor to watch, it would be the stock market. In 2021, it grew at a record level, almost 21% in inflation adjusted dollars, but also to watch the role that inflation is playing because that does have a moderating effect as it relates to how Americans feel about their financial and economic circumstances. Uh, going forward, the stock market plays a role, not just in terms of financial and economic security, but also for very large gifts. In 2021, we saw the rise, continued rise of mega gifts with McKinsey Scott making the news and the headlines with many of her large gifts. But we also saw a lot of large donors respond because they had the capacity to do so. And the stock market is a very good indicator of those um, uh, large donors' ability to make those commitments. Putting all of the data together, the third finding that I'd like to share is that across the board, we had three out of the four sources of giving that we track experiencing growth. And charitable bequests were really the only part of the landscape that saw a slight decline. Much of that was because 2020 was really such a strong year. And charitable bequests are by far the most volatile component of giving because that tends to be driven by very large estates moving uh, the needle one way or the other. Now, in this economy, we have to take into account inflation, which is something we have not had to do in the past. So adjusting for inflation, you'll note that while giving grew by about 4%, in inflation adjusted terms, this means that we basically held steady. In general, this is good news because 2020 was indeed such a strong year. I'm going to also share the fourth finding, which is that individuals and foundations are two largest uh, sources of giving, actually achieved very high records 
In fact, both for both of those giving levels, these are the highest, second highest levels on record when we adjust for inflation. We also know that very large gifts by wealthy, ultra high net worth individuals totaled $15 billion. And we have been tracking these large gifts for many years now and have not seen uh, gifts of that magnitude. You may ask, what is a mega gift? In our data, mega gifts are gifts of over $450 million. So it is really um, something to watch going forward because we're seeing that uh, as wealth and income become more concentrated in the United States, there are a lot of donors that are able to make those large scale commitments. So many organizations are thinking about how they continue to build those relationships and also to engage those donors as it relates to mega gifts. What we've also found with mega gifts in this era is that many funders, individual donors, as well as foundations are adopting unrestricted funding models. So one of the most no noteworthy facts about McKinsey Scott's gifts is that they were all unrestricted. Howard University, a historically black college and university, received a $40 million gift, unexpected from McKinsey Scott. The president received this phone call and there were no restrictions on that gift. So we are seeing new models, not just these uh, record levels of giving, but also uh, less restrictions or fewer restrictions and um, fewer red tape models around reporting and more of a trust-based model. So I think all of these are really good news elements for nonprofit. As we think about what this data means for everyone in the sector, this is also a point to note that there are some challenges ahead. Here at the Lilly Family School, we have been tracking the role of individuals in philanthropy. We've also noted that for a very long time, giving was very broad-based. Americans of all backgrounds participated in charitable giving. And actually, giving was um, shared, a shared trait among Americans of all backgrounds. Starting around the time of the Great Recession, we saw that participation rates start to decline. And today, it's about 50% of all Americans participate in giving. While the giving rates have fallen over time, we've seen the dollars that Americans contribute increase or hold steady. We call this donors down, but dollars are up or holding steady. Now, as we look ahead, there is an opportunity for all of us to work to continue to build this culture of American generosity. At the beginning of the 21st century, two thirds of all Americans gave, and this was pretty consistent over time. It was in fact, we had termed it recession proof because it didn't budge during recessions. However, around the time of the Great Recession, we saw this number dip below 50%, and it has actually stayed there even as the economy has recovered. So as you look ahead, I think we all have a call to action to say whether you're a fundraiser, a nonprofit leader, a board member, how can we continue to build this culture and reverse this trend that we saw before the pandemic? I want to emphasize this data was collected before the pandemic. And we are hopeful that the pandemic has offered this opportunity for many more Americans to enter into charitable giving and hopefully uh, donors will stay engaged and all of us in the nonprofit sector have a role to play there. When we look at why many stopped giving, the economy played a role during the Great Recession, but we also know that declines in religious attendance and affiliation and also trust levels. While nonprofits cannot control all of these factors, we have in the nonprofit sector the ability to build trust and to encourage transparency and accountability within our organizations, which are all factors that can build trust, especially for younger donors. Now, back to our top 10 list. One of the bright spots in Giving USA 2021 is the corporate giving number. Corporations gave generously in 2021, and a lot of that was because GDP uh, increased. GDP grew by over 10% in 2021, adjusted for inflation. It's still a 5% growth rate, so very strong economy boosted corporate giving. 
in addition, corporations also saw their pre-tax profits increase by 37.4%. So a great time to build relationships and also re recognize that corporations have become more strategic in their approach and thinking about how your nonprofit can align with a corporation's overall giving priorities. Uh, that would be a good, this would be a good time to think through those strategies. Now, as we shift gears, Giving USA also tells us not just who gave, but also where all that giving went. And here is also where there's an opportunity to really learn from uh, these data points and see what that might mean for your organization. Uh, unfortunately, I can't see where everyone is located in terms of subsectors, but we do know that some of the top performers in Giving USA 2021 were subsectors that struggled in the pandemic period. So here, let's just quickly highlight arts and culture was a high performer in 2021, growing at a record 27.5%. Arts and culture saw a rebound primarily because arts and culture and humanities organizations were able to resume a lot of the face-to-face -face events and fundraising, but they were also supported by the very strong economy. High net worth donors in particular tend to support arts and culture organizations, and this uh, was able to rebound in 2021. Similarly, health organizations. This includes groups like American Heart Association, American Cancer Society, and many, many others. They were also able to uh, on, on experience growth as conditions improved in the economy, and many nonprofits were able to adapt to the uh, environment by introducing in-person events, but also virtual events as well. So innovation, resilience, and the ability to adapt are very key themes in Giving USA 2021. I'm also very pleased to see that religious congregations uh, saw some moderate growth in, in this uh, 2021 period. Although adjusted for inflation, you can see that religious congregations remained relatively flat, but they were able to hold their own in contrast to what we saw in 2020. It's also encouraging to note that for religious congregations, those that made investments in technology in online giving, in online engagement, were the ones that benefited the most. So this is really a time to think about how to build in those capabilities if uh, you don't have them currently. Now, it's also worth noting that not all subsectors uh, did as well in 2021. In particular, some subsectors that did really well last year, 20, well, the year of the pandemic, 2020, saw some moderate growth, some moderation in 2021. This is not to say that they took a, a decline, but really uh, just that their record levels of giving were not necessarily sustained. But as we look uh, across the board, this is more of a good news story because uh, many of these organizations did see very significant growth in 2020 and some were able to maintain those levels going into the 2021 period. And then finally, uh, some really interesting trends for the environment, public society benefits and foundations. Giving to these three areas grew for two consecutive years, and all of them grew by more than 10%. So this is a bit of a, a rising tide story. Public society benefit in particular includes the National Donor Advice Funds, but also United Ways, United Jewish Appeals, and many other umbrella organizations. Um, giving to public society benefit and foundations is very much linked to growth in financial markets. The environment is an area that has shown really impressive growth over time. Young donors in particular are excited about uh, giving to the environment, uh, giving to climate and many other related causes. And we also note that environmental nonprofits have been at the forefront of using technology to engage their donors and to maintain and build relationships. Now for the ninth finding, as we look at the data and sift through all of the findings, we have come up with several key words. The first is really the need for innovation and the need for adaptability going forward. 
as nonprofits navigate this terrain that is changing so rapidly, they will need to adjust to staffing challenges, demand shifts, but also supply chain disruptions. We're also seeing new ways of giving that are increasingly popular. Donors want the ability to give in these new ways, not just the traditional cash and check options, but giving through their dApps. Cryptocurrency, planned giving tools, and hybrid events have also uh, gained a lot of foothold with the momentum, uh, with the momentum of the past few years. Now, keep in mind that we had for the tenth and probably the one finding I want to emphasize: online giving now accounts for twelve percent of overall fundraising. This is a new record. In fact, when we look at the data, we recognize that online giving has been growing at double digit rates, but has remained at under 10% until the events of 2020, where we saw an inflection point giving jumped from uh, the under 10% to over 10%, and we expect this growth to continue. As we sift through this online giving and the shift to using technology in fundraising, there are some new questions that emerge. The first one is really trust. We started to talk about trust at the beginning of this presentation. We talked about the role that trust plays in giving decisions. And the question that everyone is asking is how do we build trust with donors in this online and virtual environment or even in the hybrid environment? We know that uh, trust is built through engagement and relationships. We also know that that's more difficult to achieve in a virtual or online environment. However, many organizations that have made these investments in online and virtual methods are seeing a lot of success. We've also seen that as uh, we look at these numbers, especially with online giving, organizations are reporting a lot of new donors that are showing up at their organizations. And uh, looking ahead, the challenge is going to be how to build uh, on those, uh, I'd say, new donor relationships, sustain and engage those donors, and ultimately expand the uh, engagement with those donors, which will lead to much more sustained uh, records of fundraising over time. So let's look at that data more closely. As I shared, we've been tracking this now for many years, um, starting at the uh, 2012 period. You can see that online giving was about six, seven percent. It started to inch up to eight, nine percent. And prior to the pandemic on uh, 2019, the most recent data was under 10%. We've seen uh, online giving continue to grow. And right now it's sitting at that 12%. Uh, many organizations have made those investments, those critical investments in online giving, and we expect that to continue. So um, with that, I'd like to just return to the very theme that we started with, which is philanthropy, um, philanthropometrics, you may recall the combination of, I'm gonna go back to that uh, initial slide in a moment, but just to say that philanthropy at the Lilly Family School, we've involved both philanthropy, which is the love of mankind and the notion of measurement metrics. When we bring these two terms together, philanthropy metrics, we have this powerful concept that we can actually measure our work in philanthropy, but also continue to build and sustain those relationships, the love of humanity, the inspiration, and all of the work that takes place in the nonprofit sector. So as we look ahead, I just like to ask, please comment on the surprises, the top trends that you see. We're now going to open it up to questions. Uh, you all have the chat feature. I also have some additional slides that we I can share during the question answer period but want to leave a lot of time for those questions. So at this point, I'll stop sharing, um, but I will turn it over to our moderator. Or let me know if I should stop sharing. I do have some additional slides. Una, you can keep the, uh, the screen sharing going. Um, okay. And we'll start with a few questions that we have so far. I'd like to remind everybody again, there is a QA and a uh, button or widget in your webinar viewer that you can use to initiate a question uh, for Una and Rick. 
but uh, we have a few teed up here. So uh, let's start with why does giving to religion continue to be a smaller percentage of the whole? What factors are in play there? Well, I can start, but uh, Rick, please feel free to jump in. So there are several factors to note. I think the very first one to keep in mind is that over time, we've seen fewer Americans affiliate with denominations. In the 1960s, when religious congregations received two thirds of all giving, we had probably 80 to 90% of Americans affiliating with a particular religious tradition. In fact, the group that is growing the fastest is the group of non-affiliates. In the 1960s, it was about 5% of Americans who said, I don't have any religious affiliation. Today, that's 20 percent or more. So that's the fastest growing segment. So that's one, fewer Americans affiliating with religious congregations. The second one is participation rates. We see um, in the 1960s and 70s, many attended services on a weekly basis. And now very few attend on a weekly basis or even a monthly basis. Uh, so we're seeing uh, fewer uh, Americans attending services. And then finally, uh, and a third trend is just participation in religious uh, activities more broadly have also declined. There are a lot of reasons for this um, decline, but it's especially true when we look at the youngest Americans who are much less likely to participate, to affiliate or attend services. So I think there's a big factor there the second share of um, explanations for religious congregations is that we've also seen uh, many other uh, charitable organizations perhaps uh, taking up a lot. If you think of it from a almost uh, distribution standpoint, a lot of charities that might have functioned as religious congregations are now operating mostly as secular charities. So if we were to look more closely at each of those segments, whether it's education or healthcare, we would see the roots of religious organizations, but now these are independent of congregation. So I think it's a complex question, but it's really that uh, Americans are participating less, they're affiliating less, and people who attend services tend to give more. People who affiliate tend to give more, people who participate tend to give more. And with all of those factors declining, that has implications for the share of American philanthropy that goes to congregations. But Rick, I'd love to hear your answer. Sure, um, just to uh, uh, build on what you just said, Una. So just by way of reminder, the NTEE code, the National Taxo Taxonomy of Exempt Entities Code, uh, for giving to religion is focused uh, primarily on congregations, denominational uh, uh, umbrella uh, organizations, uh, mission, and uh, religious media. So when you think about the growth in the number of nonprofits across America over the last 20 or 30 years, uh, Una's point is really well taken that many organizations that might have been perceived or related to a congregation today might be a standalone charity and therefore the giving would not be counted as giving to religion. So um, to Una's point, it is a little bit more complex. It doesn't mean that uh, uh, religiously motivated giving is decreasing. In fact, there was a study that Una and I are very familiar with an, a few years back that showed about 75% of all giving in America is religiously motivated. Great. The uh, next question up is, uh, where are donor advised funds counted in the Giving USA report? I love this question and it's one that uh, we get asked a lot. Uh, so I'll start with a very simple answer and then of course I can say more about it. We have been tracking donor advice funds for a very long time. They are not a new part of the sector, but they are a more complex part of charitable giving because donor advice funds can either be at community foundations, and they've been there since the 1920s, national donor advice funds, or they're also single issue charities that host donor advice funds. For example, Indiana University. Uh, foundation does have donor advice funds. So depends on what perspective you are coming from. Now, how do we reflect donor advice funds within Giving USA? And that is quite straightforward. 
on the sources side, so where all the giving comes from, and I'm going to uh, just go back to the slides here so that I can quickly show this as I speak. A picture is worth a thousand words, so let's go back here and just re recall that individual, when an individual makes a gift to a donor advice fund, that is counted as an individual gift. So ex for example, Elon Musk apparently made a very large gift to a donor advice fund in 2021. He's been in the news for all kinds of things. Uh, his charitable giving <laughs> probably has not received the same amount of attention as some of his other activities, but that would be counted as an individual gift. Um, now, where do we count it on the uses side? This is where it does get complicated because if an individual makes a gift to Fidelity, Schwab, one of those national funds, that's counted under public society benefit. In contrast, if they were to establish a donor advice fund at Indiana University, that would be counted under education. So single issue charities would be counted in the sector that they uh, reside in. And then community foundations would be counted under the foundation sector on the uses side. So keep in mind with donor advice funds, there is a, a, some complexity because it isn't a one size fits all. Donor advice funds, even though we think of them as a monolith, they're actually uh, three distinct kinds the national funds that go under public society benefit, the single issue charities that could be in education, religion, the environment, arts and culture, and so forth, healthcare, some hospitals host staffs, as well as community foundations. And many forget that community foundations were actually the oldest, uh, the start of uh, donor advice funds uh, date back to community foundations with the New York Community Trust being one of the first to start those. And um, Fidelity uh, was the first national or commercial fund back in 1991. Thank you, Una. Um, following up on the, the healthcare uh, component, how much of the health sector's increase can be attributed to the pandemic? Can you pinpoint whether or not it was nonprofit hospitals or voluntary health organizations, uh, for example, American Heart, American Cancer Society that experienced the higher growth there. Okay, I am gonna go right to that health organization. Uh, you can see that giving to health grew by 7.7% in 2021. What we have seen as we disaggregated and unpacked the data is that in 2020, a lot of our large charities, American Heart Association, Cancer Society, they actually did not see a surge in their giving, even though it was the pandemic, because a lot of those COVID gifts did not go to traditional healthcare organizations. They went to research entities and to university. So as an example, many heard about Dolly Parton's large gift to COVID research. However, that did not go to a healthcare organization. It went to Vanderbilt University. So it would have been counted as education. So 2020, even though it was a pandemic year and healthcare was front and center, a lot of the large gifts went to Stanford or University of California, um, San Francisco healthcare system, and not necessarily to our uh, health charities. A lot of that is just how healthcare organizations are classified. However, in 2021, many healthcare organizations were able to resume in-person fundraising or they were able to build uh, more around the online giving environment. So virtual walks and runs took uh, hold. So people were able to give in many different ways. It's also worth noting that not all health organizations struggled in 2020. So one example is the CDC Foundation, a group that we have followed quite closely. In 2020, they launched their first ever crowdfunding campaign and raised more than $50 million in just one month on by crowdfunding. So these trends, um, I'd say just to emphasize that uh, healthcare organizations, a lot of our large scale um, healthcare organizations are supported by high net worth donors. So as the economy rebounded in 2021, especially the stock market, they were able to attract and retain a lot of their uh, existing donors, many donors came back to the causes that they really cared about in 2021, 
in contrast to what happened in 2020. Very good. Um, is the growth in corporate giving just a reaction to what happened with COVID and corporations in 2020? Yes. So there was a lot going on in the corporate sector in 2020 and 2021. I'll try to just recap. For 2021, the economy was the driver. Corporations had a really strong year. I cannot emphasize that enough. Corporate pre-tax profits increased by 37.4%. And when you look more closely at the data, it's not just tech that did well. It's not just uh, consumer spending. Across the board, we saw corporations perform quite well in 2021. And it wasn't just their uh, bottom line, this, the stock market was also a factor here. So if you put the GDP growth the uh, stock market, financial market performance, 2021 was indeed a rebound for many corporations. And they were able to allocate not just to COVID, but to many other types of nonprofits. Another factor for many corporations in 2020 and 2021 was many of them gave in response to the racial uh, justice and social justice movement. So we saw corporations giving uh, in response to many of the events that took place in 2020, as well as 2021. Thank you, Una. Um, do you have any insight or what insight could you give as to why uh, giving to education has decreased? I will start that, but I'll also ask uh, Rick if he has any thoughts. So first of all, I want to emphasize, it's not that corporate uh, education giving necessarily decreased, but education had such a strong year in 2021. Why? As I noted, education had all those large gifts that some of them were for research, COVID outreach, uh, schools and universities that had to move to virtual instruction. Uh, even K through 12 systems benefited in Detroit, in Oakland, here in Indianapolis, in New York, in Texas, where large uh, me mega donors gave to educational institutions because of the need to pivot to virtual instruction. So coming after that very uh, strong year of 2020, education, did not quite reach those levels, but what you could also look at is the two-year growth rate, which was actually uh, for all of these subsectors on the slide, 5% or more when adjusted for inflation. So while education looked like it moderated a bit, it was mostly because 2020 was such a record for education. And uh, another point to note is that educational institutions uh, had such strong need in 2020 and were able to share that with a lot of their donors. So uh, part of what is being reflected in the data is much more of a moderating effect rather than any kind of decline per se in education. But Rick, you may have some thoughts on this as well. Yeah, the only thing I'd add to that would be that um, I know that a number of institutions when the pandemic hit pulled back on major campaigns that they were working on and I think the restarting of that has, has grown in earnest towards the end of 21 and into 22. Uh, and I think the numbers for 22 will be very different. And I do think it was more the moderating effect of the overwhelming amount of giving that was to education in, in 2020. Wonderful, excellent. I agree with that. Our last question uh, today, uh, before we wrap up, uh, with the current state of the economy and inflation increasing, what do you anticipate with giving in the coming year? So a little forecasting question here. Yes, absolutely. So this is the place where we should go back to what we've seen uh, in the economy. There isn't, none of us has a crystal ball, so we can't necessarily project into the future, but we can look at these historical patterns. And one benefit of giving USA, as we've noted, is that this data goes all the way back to the 1950s, which is just so, um, I think, incredible. Now let's 
just look at the indicators that we have for 2021 and think about what that means for 2022 and beyond. First of all, the stock market, as I said, if you have to pick one factor to watch, I would pick the stock market simply because it does drive a lot of the mega giving trends that we see, but also affects people's sense of economic and financial security. And we've had a strong, uh, very strong financial market performance over the last really two years. So that bodes well for foundations, especially because they tend to give with a two to three year uh, rolling average. So as you think about the ability of foundations to make gifts in the coming years, that will continue to be strong just because of the growth we've had. Now, when it comes to GDP, GDP um, grew at a record level in 2021, 5.1%. It's hard to find a, a year, at least in recent times, where we had that type of growth. Uh, now, going forward, we keep hearing that that's not going to continue, and we expect some uh, slowdown in the growth rate. But once again, I, I think for many American households, they've been able to uh, accumulate savings that we really have two, two distinct trends. Some households that have been in a position to build up their savings, to uh, put away some resources, and may continue to be in a position to give. I think the big challenge, the, the factor that should lead us all to be more concerned as we look to the future is really inflation. Inflation grew at 4.7% in 2021. We haven't seen uh, inflation grow at that rate. You have to go back 40 years really to see a record of that level and that has continued in 2022 and beyond even as we look ahead and that doesn't seem to be slowing so I do think that there are a lot of positive indicators reasons to be very optimistic as we look at the future the fact that Americans have continued to be generous so the donor fatigue has not set in and do, new donors have actually, uh, many of them have sustained, have stayed with these uh, new organizations they're giving to and also continue to support their organizations. However, as we think about what is a concern at say inflation and uh, for many nonprofits to understand they're, that they're going to have to adapt to this changing environment and uh, adjust to the, I'd say the expectations of donors as they change. But I, I would also add um, that question is a good one because it's one we've been asking here at Dunham & Company. And uh, we fielded a study about a month ago to ask that question of donors, kind of where what's their level of confidence. So uh, we'll be releasing this next week, so you'll want to watch for that. But uh, just kind of some top lines is that donors are demonstrating uh, – they're a pretty high level of commitment to continue to give as they normally do, but definitely uh, a bit more cautious in their giving. And there's a lot of pessimism about the future of the economy. So that that part is, I think the challenging part is that the indicators around pessimism are about the highest, if not the highest we've seen, just in terms of the decline, the belief in the decline of the economy and how long it's gonna to take to recover. So, uh, like I mentioned, we'll be releasing uh, this full report next week, probably Monday or Tuesday. So, uh, be looking for that. Thank you, Rick. That wraps up our Q&A session for today and our webinar. Thank you, Una and Rick, for these helpful insights into Giving USA 2022, the annual report on philanthropy. And if you've not yet subscribed to Giving USA, you can do so at givingusa.org. Your annual subscription gives you complete access to the entire archive of Giving USA digital products, including all past reports, free digital copies of upcoming special reports, and access to special webinars around relevant nonprofit topics. In addition, you get exclusive access to an interactive dashboard that allows you to compare and contrast giving trends over the last 40 years against household income, CPI, GDP, and so much more. Finally, in the email you will receive containing a link to the recording of the webinar today, you will also find a link to subscribe to Giving USA. Feel free to share both links with your friends and colleagues. Thank you again for joining us and have a great afternoon.